Hello there. Hi, Sandy. Hi, Rob. Let's commence the program with the personal anthem of our today's guest, Robert Maddox Harley. Better to light the smallest candle than curse the darkness. And this is, I think, one of the best thoughts that can act as a beacon for all of us. Hi, viewers. I welcome you to the seventh episode of the limited series of literary and critical conversations. We are back again with one of the leading Australian artists, thinker, philosopher, Robert Maddox Harley, also known as Rob Harley, much toasted these days by the Indian literati. He is a poet, editor, painter, sculptor, photographer, and digital artist born in Sydney, Australia. He joins us today from Lismore, South Wales. His writing work includes poetry, academic essays, reviews of his scholarly books, journals, and papers. He has four volumes of his own poetry published, Scratches and Deeper Wounds, 1996, Mechanisms of Desire, 2012, Winds of Infinity, <clears throat> 2016, and The Blazing Furnace, 2022. Recent poetry has been widely published in numerous anthologies and literary journals. His past art practice for many years was sculpture, inspired by Zen Buddhism and Japanese aesthetics. However, after physical restrictions of health, he commenced digital computer art, both for the web and print. His jiggly images have been exhibited widely and featured both in and as the covers of various literary journals, academic textbooks, and anthologies. Formal studies include comparative religion, philosophy, literature, and psychotherapy. His thesis concerned Freud's notion of the subconscious and its relationship with surrealist poetry. Rob's main concern has been to explore and document the radical changes technology is bringing about. He coined the term technometamorphosis to describe this. He serves on the panel of various prestigious literary journals. For full publications, reviews, select writings, and artwork, visit his website, www.medoxharley.com. With this, I welcome our versatile, multi-talented Australian poet, painter, sculptor, writer, reviewer, cover page designer, and a much in demand Rob Harley to this show. Here, it would be contextually relevant to quote from the seventh chapter of the Gospel of Matthew in the New Testament. Quote, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles?" Unquote. And now an excerpt from one of his signature poems. The poem is titled, 
sandstone to ink. Inspired by sculptors past Noguchi, Michelangelo, and Moore, driven by a sacred muse whose face remains elusive, the spirit of the stone in silence demands an awful price. To dance on high with spirits fierce is fraught with danger's sword. Though double is the razor's edge, when dancing with the naked ape, whose tongue is sharply forked and heart is hardened with desire for more and more and more. And it goes on. It's a beautiful poem. So let's begin, Rob. Tell us something about Rob Harley, the Renaissance man. I have Thanks. this book of you, the Renaissance <laughs> man. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I think Sunil uh, coined that term, the Renaissance man. Um, and I guess it comes from the fact that I've done quite a lot of things and approached art and philosophy from sort of different angles. Um, and uh, I just have a naturally inquisitive uh, mind that wants to express the things that I see in an artistic way. So it might be in writing or it might be in sculpture or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't really matter that uh, I can't remember who said the, that the medium of your art is not the thing, it's the passion that drives it. So whether you're creating sculpture or you're in theatre or dance, it's the passion of wanting to express yourself. So mm -hmm. some people are good at carving and some people are good with words. And uh, I seem to be good at making things and also at writing. I've, I've written all my life, uh, even when I've done the other things. Mm -hmm. And it was quite astounding to me when I was a sculptor that many sculptors are also poets. It's very strange because they're nearly the opposite end of the scale. You know, stone's very hard, bang, 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 and poetry, you've got a pad and a pencil, and it's very simple. You can carry it around in your pocket. Mm -hmm. you know? so, uh, but it's quite a large number of sculptors were poets as well. So um, that's really... Uh, as much as I can say about that, but I'm very pleased. Well, that's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. So what made you feel drawn towards fine arts in the first place? Well, I knew you were going to ask me this question and I have no idea. Oh. I honestly, no, I honestly have no idea. Uh, I, in Growing up, we had no real art in the house no discussion about art. My father is a business type person. Um, and there was no artists in the immediate family. There is in the, in, on my mother's side. Um, but it, it was really a mystery to me why I was making sculpture at, say, 15 and I'd hardly ever heard the word. And I, I just couldn't work it out. I don't know. It's, the answer is I don't really know. So mm -hmm. um, so it must be something that's maybe hardwired in your genes or something like that. And I'll just explain. I, I was going to say to you before, but I'll just explain why I changed my name from Rob Hall to Robert Maddox Hall. The Robert, my full name is Robert Francis Hall. And cool. that's my legal legal nice. name. My father's name is Francis. My uh -huh. uncle's name is Robert. And uh -huh. Harl is my patriarchal name. So uh -huh. there's nothing of my mother in that. Mm -hmm. So my mother's maiden name is Maddox. Uh -huh. So I thought I'm going to change my name to Robert Maddox Harl, my art name to Maddox Harl, 
to include part of my mother in it because on my mother's side of the family is where there are poets and painters. My great uncle was a famous Indi English painter, the Royal Society, blah, blah. Oh, I see. Uh, my great grandfather was a doctor and a scientist. And here's a little hint and tip. He invented the gelatino bromide negative, which was formed the basis of the negative of every film camera up until digital photography. He invented that, my great-grandfather. He got medals from all around for, for inventing it and so on. And his wife, my great-grandmother, wrote activist poetry in Ooh. England in about 1890. Awesome. It's quite extraordinary, yeah. So I didn't discover that till a few years ago. So that's why I uh, changed my art name from Rob or Robert Harley to Maddox Hull, and I can only say that that's probably where the um, interest in art came from, from that side of the family. Yeah, it has come from your family. You have inherited the right genes. Yeah, yeah, because there was nothing at school. Like I, when I went to school, you, you, boys didn't do art. Boys played football and, you know, all of that sort of macho stuff. Um, I doubt whether you'd even be allowed to do art when I went to school. It was a pretty wild place back in the end of the 60s or the middle of the 60s in Australia, believe me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so. Okay, great. Uh, so what are your views on the sculpture as an art form? Um, well, as I just said, I think all art forms are valid, of course, but sculpture, uh, particularly the sculpture I was doing, is something that can just sit there and people can view it when they're walking past, like in a garden, and it expresses form. And uh, I once said uh, sculpture is four-dimensional poetry existing in silence. Ah, yeah. So oh, you've got. I the, came the across that definition of yours. That's a apt way of. Yeah, because, it. because you've got your three dimensions of sculpt, you know, height and all that. Yeah. Then time is included in it because of what it says to the person and, and so on. And it's like a poem, but it just sits there quietly. So my, my sculpture was particularly orientated towards being outdoors and people walking in the garden and looking at it and just contemplating on it, wasn't trying to change the world or do anything other than bring peace mm. and contemplation to people's lives. Oh, I see. Which, which is very, very different to my poetry and very different to my digital art. Mm -hmm. yeah. So approximately how much time do you take to complete a sculpture out of wood, marble or stone? Well, that's a hard question because it depends on the size. For example, I, I did a very large commission mm -hmm. uh, in marble, which was nearly four metres high, mm -hmm. which is 22 tonnes of marble. Well, that oh, took... Oh, my God. Yeah, exactly. Um, that took me 12 months, six days a week mm -hmm. of carving that sculpture um because Michelangelo's David is four meters high mm -hmm. so I think it's probably the largest piece of sculpture in marble yes. made in Australia not that that means anything but mm -hmm. that was a commission for a place down in the near Victoria mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that took all that time and took its toll on my health believe me but then a smaller piece um might take say a month and the same with sandstone. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a uh, belief that marble is like European stone. It's the stone of Europe. In other words, its colours are soft mm -hmm. and and the stone is actually fairly soft, whereas sandstone is ochre and browny red colour, which represents like the, the environment of Australia. Oh. So I see sandstone is Australia's stone if you like so I did a lot of sculpture in uh, sandstone 
which because we lived near the quarries down when we lived before we moved up to Nimbin. So I could get the sandstone directly from the quarries there close by. Uh, so that would take about the same time as doing marble and wood, depending on the size, takes less time mm. and it's not as brutal to your body. <laughs> mm. Okay. So what appeals to you more, poetry or painting, sculpture? Which are the recurring themes or motifs in your sculpture or painting? Well, as I said, uh, my sculpture is a completely different uh, thing than my poetry. My, my sculpture was inspired by Zen and by contemplation and by Japanese aesthetic, aesthetic. Uh, which is like minimalist so very mm -hmm. simple minimalist sculpture and all I was interested in was if someone was walking in the garden in the landscape to see it and feel peaceful and so on whereas my poetry is uh, as you've read some of them are very quite different and they're activist a lot of them are activist poetry trying to bring to people's attention the problems in the world, the political problems and all, all the greed that goes on and all this sort of stuff. So uh, the, the poetry is uh, completely different. Some, some aren't, but most are. Uh, painting, I'm not really a painter. I never actually mm -hmm. felt comfortable being a painter. I've done quite a few. But painting is not really my thing. But I had to wait for the computer to come along, you see. <laughs> and uh, They are quite intellectually demanding, some of your poems, when I read. The I think... I, absolutely. A friend of mine, Sunil, said once, our job is not to send the readers to the dictionary. Well, <laughs> I don't actually agree with that because I try to use the absolute right word oh. for what I want to say. And if people can't understand that, then they'll have to go and get a dictionary. Mm -hmm. And I have a French uh, friend, he's a brilliant artist, and he really enjoys my poetry, but he said, I have to keep the dictionary beside me because I'm not sure of some words that you use. Yes. But I don't mind that because I'm learning some things as well. Because mm -hmm. if we reduce our poetry to the level of a 10-year-old uh, little school person, then we're going to end up writing horrible poetry, I think. So I don't make any uh, apologies for doing that. Sorry. <laughs> but people, but... <laughs> no, that's your, your style, your signature style. So. Yes. Yeah. Um, I was yeah. really awed reading all your poems and your interviews uh, they are so well answered and poems are great <laughs> yeah thank you yes well i've been writing poems for a long while and like uh it's a quite an interesting thing i really hated english at school and i didn't do very well at it and i did well at sport blah blah mm -hmm. and then a month after I left school, I wrote my first fiction story and it was published in a prestigious uh, surfing magazine, actually. I see. And I've written articles and uh, short stories and all of those things ever since I left school. But I never wrote a word at school. I just hated it so much. So I've got a bit of a motto that school is not the measure of everything for mm -hmm. everybody. And back then, they didn't have what we have special schools now. The, the school system catered for the average person to learn and to function in society. If you're a dummy or you're very clever, too bad. But now they recognise that and a, the clever people go to a special school and are treated in a different way to bring out their... Uh, cleverness, you might say, and and That's sort of true. bypass their their foibles. <laughs> so, mm. so 
uh, in one of your interviews, I uh, read this, I quote, the essence of my work is perfectly described by Dalins. His images have a narrative quality that interlocks the technical and metaphysical, creating a space of oscillating dialogue, giving them depth and mystery, unquote. Ooh. Well, your thesis concerned Freud's notion of the subconscious and its relationship with surrealist poetry. What were your conclusions? Uh, it's a bit of a complex question, which uh, the very short answer is Freud mm -hmm. was a load of rubbish. <laughs> Sorry? That's Freud was wrong. Oh, okay. That that's that's the conclusion. Mm -hmm. But I'll have to answer it a bit longer. Freud was a brilliant thinker, of course, and a pioneer in many ways. But when I studied Freud at uni, all this business about the Oedipus complex, ah. penis penis envy, and all the Oedipus. the idea yeah. that we are driven by subconscious latent yeah. sexual desires i thought this is a load of rubbish it ego thought, and super ego mm, so how can i show that this is not correct so in my thesis i wrote a computer program mm -hmm. to write poetry oh, okay. this is in 2000 by the way before all of this artificial intelligence business oh. okay so the idea was the computer wrote poetry and the computer can't have a subconscious mind, right? So it's just where it was. Then I compared that with the surrealist poets' mm -hmm. poetry and I looked at the latent sexual content in both of those poet poems in the love of poetry. Mm -hmm. And to my surprise, it came out that the computer had far more latent sexual references than the surrealists. Mm -hmm. That's astounding, actually, because the surrealists believe that they were looking into the subconscious, as mm -hmm. Freud's thing, uh, and you would expect to have a lot of sexual references and that type of thing in the surrealist poetry. There was mm -hmm. hardly any, but there was a, a lot, lot more in the computer poetry that didn't have a subconscious mind. Oh. Mm -hmm. So, but... That didn't go down very well mm -hmm. because a couple of the examiners were devout Freudians mm -hmm. and they hated me and they hated that because if you've spent your whole academic life investing in a certain thing and then someone comes along and says, sorry, that's wrong, oh. they're not going to accept that. So yeah. so that was basically the result of the, the that oh, thesis. Okay. Yeah. 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 It's a bit complicated. <laughs> Yes, yeah, it's very complicated. Yeah. But the interesting thing is that with all this artificial intelligence that's out now, it's the flavour of the month. Mm -hmm. If you go to one of those devices and say, write me a poem on something, you'll get a poem. And the poem is like written by an eight-year-old child. Mm -hmm. And... Even back then, my poetry writing program, it mm. was just a rule-based number crunching thing, not an artificial intelligence thing. Mm. The poetry was better than the artificial intelligence ones now. So I don't know what's going to happen with all that. Mm. Yeah, so that was the result of that, yeah. I see. And I was going to uh, continue after that with a PhD, uh, along the same lines, but then I had the accident with a tree, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, nearly killed me. And uh, yeah, I ended up with a big tree on my head. Oh, uh, it um, um, I know that. ended up with a hemorrhaging brain, paralyzed, mm -hmm. fractured spine, and all that. So it's a miracle that I'm sitting here talking to you, but. I thought I can't deal with the pressure of doing a PhD mm -hmm. having had this accident. So, and then after I sort of got better, it mm -hmm. was too late. And I thought, no, I don't need to do that. So, mm -hmm. yeah. 
So there's still a lot for you to do for humanity. And that was the reason you were saved. And it's your second life now, second innings. I, <laughs> I would say so, yeah, because yeah. nobody could believe that I was alive. That's for sure. Yeah, they just, the nurses and doctors stood by the bedside and said, it's impossible for you to be alive. But like the tree was this diameter from four meters. That's that's why I got scars on my head. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I'm okay now. By God's grace, you were saved. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, uh, this term I liked a lot when I came across it. Uh, tech techno metamorphosis. Uh, can you please throw light on this term that is coined by you? You say techno metamorphosis. Well, uh, the things that humans do bring about a, a change or a metamorphosis in what happens. And uh, I think since probably 1970, the advances in technology have been so great that we haven't seen that sort of uh, advances before. I mean, we invented the light globes and then we invented the motor car and that was all went along slowly but still changed humans for sure but then the rapid increase with computers and communications i think has brought about not a dna physical change in humans which is debatable but we'll say not but it's certainly brought about a mental tech uh, metamorphosis and that's what i mean by all the technology that like we're doing here, I'm sitting here in Lismore talking to you, video in Canada, like that was unimaginable mm. a few years mm. ago. So this has definitely changed our mentality. Um, so that's what I mean by the techno metamorphosis. Great. So it describes the irrevocable changes technology is bringing about for all humans and your concerns about our cyborg, transhuman, and posthuman future, right? Yes, yeah. And we were just looking yesterday at some of the uh, some social media footage of these robots that are the in thing at the moment, and they are really, really scary. That that they are so. Oh, yeah articulate and know what's going on and driven by artificial intelligence uh, I believe that artificial intelligence will be a bigger thing than the industrial revolution it is going to challenge every aspect of our society uh, whether or not it's good or not I don't know because I tend not to want to say what's right or wrong or tell people what to do. I just want to present something. So in, in my digital artwork, I might present like a cyborg in a situation, like that last poem where the, the cyborg is there and there's a rat and it's called... Yeah, the, there the, are some graphics too in your books. Yeah, I like to include, I like to include yes. that. So yeah. I saw that uh, image of cyborg. Yes. Well, that's something that I sort of developed over the years. And that's that's not done with artificial intelligence. That's done with computer programs. Um, and I can't really see the point in sitting there with a paintbrush and painting all that when I can go do, 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 <laughs> and do it that way. So, uh, but the idea is that the I'm presenting a scenario so people can look at it and decide it if they want that future for themselves or their children. I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying it's wrong because I don't feel it's my position to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I feel it's my position to present what I see and then people can make their decisions whether they like it or not and then do something about it. Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. if we all sit here totally asleep, then... Silicon Valley and all of the entrepreneurs and the extreme capitalists are just going to take us over. You need very strong imaginative ability to do this kind of work that you are doing. 
Apparently you do, yeah. <laughs> a friend jokingly said to me one day, what's it like to have no imagination? <laughs> oh. And he was joking the reverse, of course, yeah. Uh, well, I don't know. I must have, yes. But, uh, I just marvel at the work that you are doing. It's very difficult, very challenging, but yet I know that it's very satisfying also. Very yes. gratifying for the artist when he completes that piece of art. Yes, and you really want to be doing it for yourself and be satisfied with it for yourself because some people will look at it and, oh, that's fantastic. Another person will look at it and say, that's terrible or whatever. Mm -hmm. So after you get to my age, you get a pretty tough skin and you don't really care anymore, if you know what I mean. But when you're younger, mm -hmm. somebody, it's funny how if if there's 20 comments and 19 praise you and one comment rubbishes you, you concentrate on that one thing and you think, why did that happen? What is wrong there? You don't think about the 19 people that were positive about it. It's mm. just a thing of human nature, I think. Yeah. Mm. Uh, your black and white images and especially film images have a unique appearance, nothing like those which are created with digital works. They are stunning and getting very popular. How do you view photography as a modern visual form of communication? Yeah, I well, I think it's sort of it's really behind a lot of the computer uh, programs as well, the di an image created. But with photography, with a film, film camera, it's becoming a lot more popular. Young people are really getting interested in this idea that there's this film and you've got to take your time and prepare the shot you don't just go click, click, delete, click, delete. Oh, yeah, there's a good one. You've got to spend some time doing it, getting your lighting right and all this sort of stuff. And when I was younger, I I started developing my own negatives and prints when I was about eight or nine years of age. My uncle gave me this Kodak thing that you put a negative on and then a, a paper, print paper on it, and then you develop it in a little box in the dark. Mm. And that was my first introduction to photography. And I had a dark room for black and white photography okay. ever since till we moved up here, yeah. And uh, I still now use a black and white film camera because mm. you can get a quality with that that isn't like a digital camera. It's mm -hmm. not better or worse, it's just different. Okay. And something that I really like doing just because I do. And I suppose I should because my great grandfather invented it, like I just told you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we've got an antique sort of shop in Lismore, and the fellow loves to buy second hand film cameras and sell oh. them to young people to encourage young people to get back into film photography oh. rather than mobile phone, click, 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 you know, <laughs> because it sort of becomes meaningless. In a way, if you take 20 photographs and you get rid of, you know, 14, then is there any meaning to those photographs compared with if you take a lot of time and then you develop it yourself and print it and control the whole way it looks? So mm -hmm. I think photography is it will always have its place in art and, and society. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, I present an excerpt from one of your poems, Closing the Circle, a spiritually and intellectually demanding poem. Uh, it's from your collection of poetry, The Blazing Furnace. Quote, only mysticism can know the arcane truth, the Euroboros symbol ancient, ubiquitous, explains the closing circle. Alchemists, the keepers of this shrouded secret, their blazing furnace manifests. The stone, unquote. 
in this reference, then I will ask you a question. In Setu's November 2022 issue, 10 images of yours were published. Do you remember? That shows uh, the difference between old school photography and your latest digital artwork creations. Mm -hmm. Most of your digital artworks, which exist as Jikle prints, comment on a dehumanized universe, dystopian future, and destruction of our natural world. What are the underlying reasons behind this artistic vision, Rob? Well, I, like I just said, I just want to bring it to people's attention where our society is going. And it's a very different world that I'm in than when I was five years of age. When we were five years of age, we'd go fishing and you'd have a campfire. And I think we had a telephone, maybe. Uh, but now we're racing towards this future uncontrollably that uh, it's, it's sort of like we don't have control in what we're doing with our lives. I'm not saying it's really better or worse, but I still have a soft spot for sitting around a campfire, cooking mm -hmm. some food, having a cup of tea, singing songs, you know, with friends with musical instruments and that sort of thing. That, like, is a real human thing. Mm -hmm. And it's what Indigenous societies have done for thousands and thousands of years, particularly Australian Indigenous society, have been in this land for something like 50,000 years. Mm -hmm. It makes like even India and Buddhism, it makes that look like recent history, doesn't it? So, mm -hmm. uh, and they are particularly connected with the land and uh, and the whole thing that goes with uh, being totally connected with the land. It's actually a unique thing mm -hmm. in the world, the Indigenous Australians. Well, mm -hmm. That poem, The Sandstone to Ink, about the Hawkesbury River is a place that's a bit like that for me. I call it my spiritual home. It's the Australian bush and the sandstone and the river. Uh, it's a magical sort of a place. Well, all of the things we're doing with supermarkets and fast lane and all of those things are tending to use us rather than us using them sensibly. I try to use technology to my advantage, if you mm. like, not have it using me. So, for example, I switch my mobile phone off when I go to bed because I don't want the bloody thing ringing in the middle of the night and waking me up. So I feel I'm a bit in control of some of the technology. So a lot of the artwork with the dystopian future is I guess my prediction of it because I read uh, Aldox Huxley's book Brave New World way way back and it was written in I think 32 1932 or 1939 I can't remember okay. and he predicted all of this stuff he he had these creatures called epsilons which were like mindless uh, entities fed on soma, which is like a pacifying drug. Mm -hmm. And that's what a lot of society reminds me of. And he predicted that way back then, before computers, before all of those sort of things. Mm -hmm. uh, and that really stuck in my mind, Huxley. He would probably be, Brave New World would probably be one of the major influences mm -hmm. in my thinking in that direction. Mm -hmm. And but then when I was doing the sculpture, I didn't like that whole idea. I didn't want to be negative and depressing with dystopian stuff. So the sculpture was a bit of a balance for me in the spiritual or the Zen side of things. Mm -hmm. So like there's an artist, um, Polish artist, Zadislaw Beksinski. And you might have seen his work. He's got like faces that are eaten away and they're crawling through burning ruins and all this sort of thing. Well, that's really dystopian art and it's very disturbing and depressing and what have you. Mm -hmm. And it's it's interesting with that because I read a book, I've got a book by, about him and a psychotherapist wrote why he did all this. And 
the psychotherapist did not mention that he was 10 years of age within a couple of kilometres of the concentration camp at Ostwich mm. in Poland. And he doesn't even consider that that influenced his artwork. Like, can you imagine what was happening with the Jews going into Auschwitz and being killed and all this sort of stuff mm. just around the corner from your home? And this stupid psychotherapist didn't even mention that. I, I oh, was astounded. Mm. It's just ridiculous, yeah. But his artwork, have a look at it. Beck Sinsky uh, mm. is a really dystopian artwork. Mm -hmm. I've got to say, I love it. <laughs> mm. Okay, that's a way of presenting the ugly side and uh, sometimes to, you know, change it, you have the desire that it should be changed for the better. Mm. Uh, well, uh, you have studied comparative religion. What are your insights into this interdisciplinary field? Yeah, it's... Uh... It's a complex field, but I sort of am interested in spiritual side of things and religion since I was very young. I joined the Theosophical Society when I left school at 17 uh, because I didn't like organised religion. Mm -hmm. uh, and I used to write things and make statements about it. And I thought, nobody's going to take any notice of what I say, but if I got a university degree in that subject, then it'll have a little bit more um, influence, you might say, which is one of the reasons that I studied comparative religion and philosophy of religion. And we studied, I had uh, uh, in, in the Indian side of things, I had a wonderful Indian professor at Deakin University, had a Buddhist professor, oh, yeah. had a so they were each a, a professor in their own, and a Muslim, yeah. So we got to study all, all the various systems of religion and also the spiritual things, because I think we have to be, I think we have to see the difference between a spiritual belief system and a religion. To me, something like the Catholic religion is just a, big organisation to control people and to keep people away from God because they put themselves between them and God when the whole deal is between the individual and God. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm, not, I'm not commenting whether there is a God or isn't a God or looking into that side of thing. I see the religions as oppressive for ordinary people and keeping them away from living a good spiritual life mm -hmm. like for example sandra's grandmother never went to church didn't know anything about religion and she would have been one of the greatest christians on the planet she took people in to help them and feed them and did anything for anybody like that christian style of mm -hmm. what have you uh, so the, studying the religion gave me what I feel a little bit of authority to speak on it and knowledge of the different systems and how particularly like the Islam or Muslim is really misunderstood by a lot of people, particularly in the West, not so much in India because you've got Pakistan and so on, mm -hmm. but like people in Australia are just petrified of Muslims. They think that there's some big ogre that's going to take over the world and what have you, you know, and they have got no idea about what the Islamic religion is like or how when it eventuated or how Muhammad became a prophet or all of that sort of thing, you know. And we've got a few friends around here I've had to straighten out a little bit with things like that um, just to let them know that they're not coming from the right place. So... I'm like 100% tolerant of anybody that wants to believe in whatever they want to believe in. That's their business. But I don't want people telling me what I should believe in or I don't want them going around mm -hmm. preaching that you should believe this and you should believe that. Well, mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned, if you mess up this life and God mm -hmm. didn't like it, well, it's between you and God, not with a bloody priest in the middle of it, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Great.
from a very young age, you have been close to the natural world and its inhabitants that cannot speak directly. In your statement, you say that you cannot sit back epsilon-like and let the greed of the mindless neo-capitalists destroy that which they barely perceive. This is our only home. The global problems of social inequality, environmental destruction, and mind manipulation are increasing rapidly when they should by now be almost non-existent. In light of this, how do you feel about climate change? Can eco-poetry make a difference? Can it really help in reversing the planet Earth? Uh... I'm not sure whether poetry can make a difference or not, because probably the people that should read the poems don't. Uh, I don't know that many people in Wall Street making decisions about their company's profits actually read my poetry and could care less whether they're destroying the planet or not. But we have to do what we've got to do, and every tiny little bit might make a difference. Um, I think... Um, the, ter the term climate change has somewhat clouded the unbelievable pollution and destruction of the planet. They're not the same thing. The climate is changing. There is no question about it. But it's changed before in the Ice Age, for example, when there was no humans on, very few humans on the planet. The, the climate has actually changed completely. So now the climate is changing and we can measure it like, the CO2 is 42% now in the atmosphere and it's been 22% for the last 25,000 years. So the climate is definitely changing. Whether or not it's because of a natural thing and us or just us is a big question, I don't know. But it tends to cloud the fact that we are overpopulated the planet and we are uh, polluting it with too much consumerism like example i always use i've got a desk a stovetop coffee making thing made in italy it'll last me my lifetime whereas the same thing from one of these big department stores that has chinese junk in it it will only last a year so it produces all that pollution to make that coffee thing it'll last me about a year then i throw it away and there's more pollution so by buying quality items and consuming less, we can help the planet um, by not having as much pollution and the plastics, so, you know, in the oceans around Indonesia and places mm -hmm. like that are unbelievable. And the wildlife that dies because of getting caught in all of this mindless throwing away junk, you know. It was after the Second World War, the West went, We've won the war. Let's start consuming. We can buy new refrigerators and we'll have this and we'll have that. And since then, uh, we've become a totally consumer society, whereas prior to that, you'd go down to your local shop and you'd probably have a container and they'd put your flour in it or whatever, and you wouldn't have all this throwaway packaging and so on and so forth. So um, that's... Uh, I think we can only we can write poetry and we can publish things and at least some awareness often. is created by writing poetry. Say again. Some awareness among the masses can be created through poetry as well, don't you think so? Yeah, probably so. And probably with its it seems to be increasing with the internet, like on Instagram and what have you. There's quite yeah. a few people write poetry and they've got a lot of people following them. Well, if that wasn't there, uh, the people wouldn't maybe be aware of what's happening with some river or whatever. So I think uh, anything we do towards that end is a positive thing for sure, yeah. But I'm just not sure how powerful art is mm. or poetry is for changing the world because there's plenty of 
John Lennon wrote a song called Imagine, you know, imagine living in peace and all what have you. Well, it didn't stop the wars, did it? Like, I mean, look at Russia and the Ukraine, what's going on there? Like, that'd be unbelievable. So John Lennon was very popular and everybody knows his song, millions of people, but it didn't stop the wars. Mm -hmm. So, But we can only do what we can do. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, now, uh, who are the most important intellectual and philosophical influences in your rich and eventful life? Um, there's, there's quite a lot, and I'll probably forget some, but I'd say uh, Jean-Paul Sartre was uh, a fairly major influence for me, mainly because of existentialism, mm -hmm. because I believe being true to yourself before anything else is the most important thing. If, you, if you're doing paintings to satisfy a market over, you know, in some in art gallery, but it's not what you want to do, then you're not being true to yourself. So what's the point? So mm -hmm. uh, I would say if if I had a philosophy, for me, it would be existentialist philosophy, believing being true to yourself, trying to act the way you believe you should, you want to act, not, not being pushed around by society and what have you. And Sartre looks into this in very severe ways, you know, like with a soldier that's told to go out and kill those people. And the soldier says, no, I'm not going to. I don't want to do that. So they'll court-martial that soldier, but at least that soldier was being honest to himself. And I, I actually think this is one of the reasons why there's such a high suicide rate amongst Vietnam veterans, oh. because they were forced to go to Vietnam, forced mm -hmm. to kill other people when they didn't want to, when it wasn't. It wasn't mm -hmm. like the Second World War where, you know, the whole world had gone into this. Because I get, my dad is a veteran of the Second World War and he's still alive. Mm -hmm. So he knows a fair bit about that sort of thing. And uh, the Vietnam War was a very different psychological approach to us in society. Uh, because when I was, I can't remember how old I was, it doesn't matter, but conscription was in in australia and i went to the post office the post box the mailbox at the front and i took this letter out and it was from the department of defense and i thought here we go and i opened it and it said you have been exempt from national service hmm. which was one of the greatest days of my life because if it i hadn't been if i had been called up i probably would have been a conscientious objector and that would have completely destroyed the relationship between the father and myself because he doesn't believe in that sort of stuff. <laughs> He's old school. <laughs> so that was an amazing event in my life, not being called up just because the lottery didn't happen, you might mm. say. Uh -huh. Yeah, because I've had friends that escaped from America, or not escaped, they moved through from America to Canada to avoid being conscripted and being sent to Vietnam. Oh. Mm -hmm. Very, very uh, torrid times they were. Mm. Correct. Okay. In an earlier interview to Sunil Sharma, you have once said that you call a spade a spade. You are a radical, a progressive, a no-nonsense person. These are some rare traits these days. Your art questions the official narratives and reveal the truth from a liberal humanist perspective. So this is uh, what you are doing wonderfully. Uh, and I appreciate that. Oh, good. <laughs> now, what kind of message would you like to send to the new millennial and new generation audiences across the globe? 
<laughs> That's a hard question. Like I said, I don't really want to tell people how to live or what to do, but I would just reiterate what I said about existentialism, that I think we should try to do what we believe we should be doing. So if, for example, someone wants to become, a young person wants to become a poet, then write the poetry you want to write. And if somebody says that's terrible, don't take any notice of them unless it's constructive criticism. If they say you could have done that better by so on and so on, that's the way we learn. That's fine. But if they say I don't like that and so on, then you just have to learn to ignore that and do your own thing because you can't please all the people all the time. Hmm. And I learnt this the hard way. I'd made this sculpture once and I had them in my studio at home. Mm -hmm. And I said to Sandra, that sculpture, no one's ever commented. They're never going to buy it. There's nobody interested in it. I won't do any more like that. Mm -hmm. And the next day a person came in and said, oh, I love that. And they bought it. <laughs> they purchased it. And I thought, learn something from that because eventually somebody will, whatever you've created, will speak to them. And uh, you can't please all the people all the time. So, my, yeah, my message would be just to do your own thing honestly and um, leave very few footprints. In other words, like they say, walk softly and carry a big stick. <laughs> no, you are leaving very strong footprints. But, of, yeah, I hope charity. they're good ones. Yeah? I hope they're good ones. Mm. And not, but not bad ones. Like, for example, I think like Vladimir Putin is leaving very bad footprints. Mm. Uh, and I wouldn't like to be doing anything like he's doing. So at least I feel happy with with what I've done and what I'm doing. I feel like I might make a difference to some people's lives. They might think, oh, I've never thought about that before. That's a... That's an interesting thing, yeah. Um, but um, at least uh, there is some benchmark. Yes, you have yes. established the benchmark, and people will try to reach to some level, if not your level. Well, well, <laughs> yeah, I don't. Yeah, it's uh, Australia is a funny sort of a place. Be I'm, I'm mentioning this because. Uh, well, they call it the tall poppy syndrome in Australia. If you achieve something mm. um, quite uh, extraordinary, mm -hmm. the population wants to cut you down. They don't want any tall poppies. They want everybody just to be equal and nobody very smart and nobody very clever. It might happen mm -hmm. in other countries as well. But unless you're a sports person in Australia, anything else you do doesn't really count. And in the end of the 60s, uh, be saying you're a poet, you would likely to be heart bashed or like really totally out of the question. And if a boy wanted to become a dancer, it was just not even heard of, you know. Australia is a tough society and you don't do poetry and dance and do the arts. You get a real job, you know. <laughs> and that's the sort of thing that... Uh, I had to grow up with actually, and I've written a poem about how the, the young boy's skin starts out too thin and supple, but soon the surface starts to harden and gentle boys grow into granite men. So you end, to survive physically or psychologically, you need to develop a fairly strong exterior if you like, in Australia, so that the each soft inner centre, the sensitive centre, mm -hmm. can get expressed that way, which is one thing I really love about India because artists are thought of as real human beings that have got some contribute, some co co contribution to humanity in India and in Europe, but not in Australia. Mm. So That's sad. Yeah. So you become all bitter and twisted. <laughs> yeah. Not quite. Yeah.
No, but you are so well received in India and in other yes. countries, if not in Australia. So don't mourn this fact and uh, just be optimistic. Things might change. This video yes. will be watched by more than 3.5 million people. <laughs> people will yes. know about the Uber, the kind of work you are doing. Yes, yes. Yes. So thank you so much. This conversation today has been very productive and personally very enriching. You indeed are one of the last Renaissance figures standing in a mass society. Through your multiple artistic interests and pursuits, you want to make this reified world a better place by adding a rich aesthetic dimension to its banality. Thanks, Rob, for your quality time. Thank you Thanks, very Rob. much. Thank you very much, Sangeeta. I'm absolutely humbled that you wanted to talk to me. And, and uh, yes, very good. And I really appreciate the uh, association with you and Sunil and Setu as well, because as I said, uh, there's very little opportunity in Australia for this type of thing and we are creating new mm. vistas and new opportunities that way and that's why I've done quite a lot of the anthologies with you guys and with uh, J-Deep and the other ones there. That's been a real, quite an amazing thing, quite an amazing thing. So thank you very much. We had three books together with you and... Uh... One uh, for my first collection of poetry, you had written the foreword. So I'm extremely grateful uh, to you for that. Once again, I thank you for that. Yeah. Mm. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, viewers. Namaste. In our next episode, we will be here with yet another distinguished guest. Till then, bye-bye. Bye, bye. Thank you. See you. Bye. See you.